All right, so we are live, everyone. Sorry for the delay, guys. A little bit of a tech delay this morning. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, last week was a really exciting week for us. We finished up uh, Secret Path Week with a Gord Downey Cheney Wenjack Fund, so I encourage you to check out all those sessions on our YouTube channel. But today, we dive back in with a really, really exciting session, building off a program we did uh, over the last year and a bit with Banff National Park. So Banff National Park, easily the most name recognizable, iconic of Canada's national park system and one of the most beautiful places in the entire world. So today, uh, we are gonna dive in literally out in the wilds of Banff National Park. We're gonna do some macroinvertebrate sampling. We're gonna see how they test the health of ecosystems and learn from a huge number of their amazing team there. So I'm gonna turn it over to them. If you're joining us on YouTube, let me know where you're coming from in the chat bar. I'd love to see your questions. We got a great group of live classes today too. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Parks Canada team and take it away guys. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Den Otter. I am the manager of land use policy and planning here in uh, beautiful Banff National Park. Welcome. It's a bit of a chilly morning here this morning, and sometimes our cameras aren't working so well because it's so chilly, but I'm glad you're all here to join us. Um, I'm standing beside the Bow River here in Banff National Park. It's an absolutely beautiful spot, and the Bow River, these river valley bottoms, are home to some of the the richest plant and animal life that we have here in the park. And it's my job to help protect these places. Uh, what my job is, is to, to plan how we're gonna use the park and find different ways for people to use the park, to enjoy the park, while still protecting uh, everything that we love about the park. The plants, the animals, the trees, the air, and especially the water. And here today, we're gonna talk about how we better understand these water systems so that we can better protect the park so that you can come and enjoy it as much as we do. So today you're gonna to be hearing from our aquatic specialist and that's uh, Shelly Humphreys over here, who's a specialist in all things water, fish and bugs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Shelly and uh, enjoy the view and enjoy the session. Hi everybody, so my name is Shelly Humphreys and I'm the aquatic specialist for this part of Banff as well as Yoho and Kootenai National Parks. And I've been doing this job since 2003, so longer than some of you guys have been born. And today I want to talk a little bit about the office. This is our office, this beautiful place. And then we're going to talk a little bit about why we do ecological monitoring in the national parks. Then I'm going to go into some details about one of the really cool monitoring measures that I'm responsible for. And it's how we assess water quality using bugs that are in the water. And then we're going to hopefully have time to take a bunch of questions from you guys and then end off on some things that you guys can do when you come to visit or when you're at home. So those are the key parts we're going to try to fit in today. And we totally want this to be interactive. So there's going to be some chances for some questions. And I got some helpers here. So we got a few folks behind the camera that are like helping organize and make sure I don't talk for too long. And then I also have my biologists here who are gonna help me demonstrate some of the techniques and skills and some of the cool equipment that we use. So I'm gonna walk over to the creek here. Kelsey's gonna follow me. And I just wanna talk a little bit about why we do monitoring and then talk a little bit about how we monitor water. Don't sniff, winter's come early to bed. So we have a system of national parks and marine protected areas across the country. And one of our really important mandates is to make sure that as park employees, we're doing our best to take care of the park for Canadians and telling them how everything is going. And so we monitor our important animals and plants and the water and also some of the processes that have to happen for the forest and the water to be healthy. So things like fire and every national park across the country has got a monitoring program and they chose the things that were most important and representative for their park ecosystem to be part of their monitoring program. And we report this back out to Canadians and tell them how we're doing. It's like a little report card. And then in addition to that, it helps us manage better. So if we're seeing problems, we've got too many of one species, not enough of the other, some process isn't quite right, it's not happening in the right frequency, this gives us a chance to make a correction and hopefully make sure that we're protecting all the species that belong here and all the processes. 
So I'm the aquatic specialist, and myself and my team are responsible for things related to water quality and also fish and other things that are um, inside the park. We have a couple of species of wrist fish that we're pretty worried about these days. But one thing that we do every fall, all September and all October, is we come out and we measure the water quality in the park. And we do it all across Banff, Yoho Kumi, all of the mountain national parks every fall. Uh, we just finished last week all of our official sampling. Um, winters come early. It's not normally quite this snowy, but it's completely beautiful here. So I want to take a minute and tell you guys how we do it. So um, we come out here and we measure the water. And we can measure all sorts of things about the water, the chemicals that are in the water and all of that. But we also measure the bugs. And sometimes people wonder why we're measuring these bugs. So I want to show you guys a little bit of a demonstration about why just taking the water isn't good enough. So I got waders on so I can get wet. Here's my little demonstration kit. So let's say we have a truck in the park and he comes and he crashes. Whoop! And he has a little spill. If it happens during the day and we know about it, we can run out, we can grab the water. You can see, oh my goodness, the water's green. There's something wrong. Something really bad has happened here. And we know that that's happened. So that's what happens if we just measure the water. But then there's all kinds of things living in the water here. So here's my bug, here's a spider. And so, Let's say some of the bugs and the fish that are in the water here actually die because of what happens, um, or they move away, they drift away or they swim away because of the conditions that are going in the water. Um, if I come back the next day or the next week or the next month and I just grab the water, the water looks totally fine. So if I come at the wrong time, or the wrong time of year, the water looks totally normal and I have no idea that something bad has happened. But if I come back and I measure the bugs, they live here year round and they can give us a really good idea about what's going on in the ecosystem 365 days of the year, not just that five minutes when we grab the actual water. So using these bugs is called using like a biological indicator. So we're letting these bugs tell us what they think of the water quality situation in the park. And so just so you guys know, this is an inert dye, nothing dangerous. It just looks fun and it's nice and bright. So that's why we measure, use bugs to help us understand what's going on with the water quality in the park. So how did we get started with all this? About um, 10 years ago, we went all around the mountain national parks and we collected bugs in all the most pristine water in big streams and small streams and we counted them and we figured out what they all were and now we have a really good understanding of what's normal in a big stream and a small stream and the bugs are actually quite different and they tell us quite different things we've got some bugs that are really sensitive to disturbance and pollution and those are bugs that really need the water to be really good and clean and pure and cold. And then we have other bugs that aren't as sensitive and they don't mind if there's some algae or maybe the dissolved oxygen isn't that good. And so we're looking at the difference between the numbers and ratios of these sensitive and not sensitive bugs. So I wanna show you some of the cool bugs. So I'm going to take this off, but these guys are going to be pretty squirmy. How's that look there, Kelsey? You got a good look? Look at these guys. These are stoneflies. They need big rocks, and they're really sensitive to water quality. These are predators that are out in the stream. And when the water quality is bad or there isn't good spaces between the rocks, we start to lose these guys. These are one of the sensitive taxa. Get a good look at that. Excellent. So this is another group of our sensitive taxa, these guys here. I know they don't look that exciting. These guys are called caddis flies. So if you have ever been walking out in the forest and you sort of see these little tiny brown or like yellow moth-like little things flying around, that's actually what these guys turn into. 
And these guys are super interesting. They'll build um, little shells and live in the spaces and they build little nets and they filter what's in the water. And these guys are very sensitive and you can see I've got a few different kinds. This green guy is different than this guy. So sensitive, we start to lose these when the water's bad. And these are the last of our sensitive taxa. These guys are really little. These are mayflies and fish love to eat these. And they're really important in the ecosystem. And some of these guys are adapted to really fast moving water. And um, so when we start to have poor water quality, we lose the number of species and this is one of the ones that gets really affected. And we don't really have any good examples of the taxa that are not sensitive, but typically they're um, some of the worms and the midges and the mosquito larva. And when we start to see a lot of those in our sample, and not that many of those, we know that we definitely have some, some problems in our ecosystem where we have to try to figure out what it is. So I'm gonna have Mike or Brad show you guys how we catch these bugs. So you can see we've got these special nets. Um, Mike's gonna just step out and do a little demonstration. But the net is a 400 micron mesh, so things can't get through it. And then at the bottom is a little collection cup. And we do a three minute time shift. And Mike's job is to pick up all the rocks and have the bugs that are hanging on for dear life in the spaces in between end up inside the net. And then they end up inside that collection cup. So after they're in that cup, you don't have to pick them all time. It's really hard for us to pick for a full three minutes. And we're getting a little bit of ice today because it's kind of cold, but you can see all everything that's ending up in there is ending up in this cup down at the bottom. So after we're done here, we empty that cup out into some jars and we send those jars to a certified taxonomist. And so a taxonomist is a special type of scientist whose job is to identify different types of species. And these little bugs are really hard to tell apart. They do it under microscopes, and it's a it's a very specialized skill set that you have to go to university for for quite a while and learn how to do it. Um, the taxonomist figures out all the different species that are there and counts them for us, and then they send us back that information. And when we get that information back, we know what belongs here because of the big model and the big sampling exercise we did at the beginning, and then we compare it to what actually happened in our sample. And if the two items are very similar, the old historic information and our new collection, and we've got what we expect in here, then the, the report card for this location is good. It gets an A or a B. And if there's a big difference in what we got here and what we were expecting, then the site might get a C or a D because we don't have the right species that we're expecting here. Um, so that is the basics of how we do it. The program is a national program. Um, it was developed by Environment and Climate Change Canada, and it's called CABIN. And you sometimes hear people talking about benthic macroinvertebrates. That's what these bugs are. That's just a fancy name for these underwater uh, bugs that are pretty large and that they're living under the water. So that's the most important part about what we do here. Now, the second thing that we can look at, we can start to look at some of the habitats um, that we have inside the park um, and other features of this river or stream. So I want to show you guys this rock. And this is a chance to have a little interactive opportunity. Does anybody know what this is? And you guys can put this into your chat. And we'll take any guesses that people have and give people a couple seconds to see if they know what this is. And there's a little bit more of a different kind right there. Yeah. I'm just to show you, this is what a regular rock should look like. Okay. Fantastic. How cool is that? So for our live classes, yes, do type in the chat if you're on YouTube and we have hundreds of kids on YouTube right now. Uh, you guys can type in the chat too. Uh, we'd love to see what you guys think this is. So, so far we've got uh, algae coming in. Um, we've got, let's see what in the chat, algae galore. Everyone's saying algae. We've got some, we've got some algae lovers today. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Any other thoughts other than algae? I like it. 
Oh, okay, we're like, we're hardcore algae, guys. <laughs> well, you guys are absolutely right. This is absolutely algae. And I just noticed one of the bad bugs here. So I'm going to grab it. So mixed in with this algae is one of these less sensitive kind of bugs. These are the kinds that we end up getting when we've got some issues with our water quality. These are some of the um, worms that we get in bigger numbers when things aren't so great. And this is a type of algae that grows when there's um, a little bit too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. And when this happens, all of this algae takes up the space that those big stoneflies want to live in. And those mayflies I told you about, they like to go across the top of the rocks and and scrape and they can't do that when all of that is there. So this is an indication to us that there's something going on in the water. Where this rock came from? And I'll just show you guys again what a normal rock for the mountain rivers that we have in Banff should look like and a rock that has too much algae. So after we collect some of these physical attributes, there's a whole bunch of other types of measurements that we make to help characterize this river. And we do this because big rivers and small rivers have different types of bugs and we need to understand um, what's normal. And so one of the things we wanna talk about is the size of this river. And so I just want you guys to have a look across here, this beautiful river. And um, I would love to see some estimates or guesses from people about how far they think it is across the river here. And this is a great thing you guys can put into your chat. And then I'm going to talk to you about a couple different ways we can measure it. Fantastic. So again, for all our live classes, if you want the private chat and stream yard for anyone on YouTube, how wide across is the river? Anyone have any thoughts? You guys can start typing that in. I'll note that we have a few full classes. I'd love to know about full classes on YouTube too. So if you're a teacher joining us live, let me know where you're coming from in the chat bar. At least four have said that they're in. We've got 250 plus kids from all across Ontario and Canada today. 30 meters is our first guest and way to go putting it in meters, 15 meters. 20 kilometers might be a little bit of a stretch, I don't know. But uh, 15 meters, 20 meters, 13 meters, 50 meters. So there, there we go. <laughs> All right, so those are some good guesses. You guys have done a pretty good job of estimating. So we can figure this out a couple different ways. We could take a really big, long measuring tape. We've got one over there. And we could get somebody to wade across and hold the other end. Or we can use this, which is kind of fancy. So this is a range finder, and I took a measurement with this range finder, and the river is 35 meters across here. So does anybody have any idea how a range finder like this works? This is a good chat opportunity for you guys to give some ideas about how you think I can just do this and figure out that it's 35 meters across. Yeah, it sure is. Hey, and the, our teachers so far have been really great on the chat bar. You're keeping them on their toes. So our first guest is the right one. I want to see if anyone else can get it. So keep typing them in. we got some good guests pouring in so far. Okay, so universally, like algae, we all got a bunch of algae, right? Lasers is our biggest guest all over the place here. <laughs> yep, so that's exactly right. This is a laser range finder. So when I press this little button here, it sends out a little laser signal and then it bounces back and it gets received by the unit. And the unit knows how long it should take for the laser to go and come back for a certain distance. And it's um, totally calibrated. And so inside, I just see a little tiny number pop up. And people use these for golfing and for all sorts of things, but they're super handy for us to figure out how big it is across the river here. So the next thing I want to talk about is measuring how flat or how steep a particular river is. So my guys are going to demonstrate how we measure um, the slope. Are you guys ready to show me some slope? Um, but this is the device that we use here. And the reason that we do this is the slope of a river or a stream helps define how fast the water is moving and the speed of the water and the steepness um, some bugs like it and some bugs don't. And this is helping us understand what would be normal for this location. And so this is a, a level that you can look through. And then there's another person stands with a very detailed ruler and a magnifier. 
and they can make the reading upstream and then they make the reading downstream. Now, this is a plug for high school math. I have a teenager at home and my teenager always comes home and says, I am never gonna use this high school math. And I don't know why you're making me take this high school math. But this is what we're doing out there. And you guys in grade seven maybe have gotten to this. One of my guys is standing here with a little tripod. He's looking through. Inside, he can see three things. He can see the middle line, the top line, and the bottom line. And you know what this is? This is trigonometry. This is a right angle. This is a right angle. We know this number. We know this number. We know this number. And we measure these numbers. And that means we can figure everything out, including how far it is and what that distance is. So high school math, if you become a biologist, you're probably going to have to use it again. This is one of the, one of the areas that we do it. So Mike has with the survey then and Brad is just holding the ruler at the water level. And they'll do the downstream. And then they'll turn around and they'll do an upstream. And that will give us a very accurate picture of what the slope of this river is. And right here in Bab, this section of the mode is really flat. We have less than 1% slope here right now, but we've got other streams that are super steep um, in different places. a few different ways that we can measure velocity. Okay, to okay, so they're really good at hanging on to the edges of the rocks and they don't mind if the water is really fast. And then we've got those big stone flies and if the water is too fast, they're just gonna get flushed away. So we come out here and we measure velocity. And these are two different really fancy devices that do it. So this guy has a little propeller. We would go and we would put it in the water like this. And then when we turn it on, the little propeller will spin in the water. And the number of revolutions per minute get converted into a velocity about how fast that water is moving. So this is one type of technology that we can use to figure out how fast the water is moving. This one is even fancier. So this one uses acoustic Doppler. So it's kind of like the laser, little tiny pings. This goes underwater and it actually just shoots sound. And then it receives the sound and it understands um, how the difference in the sound changes has to do with how hard that sound is having to work to go against the flow of the water. So this is a really fancy way. And so although you guys might not understand what Doppler means, I'm sure you've experienced it. So if you've ever heard a plane or a car moving by fast and you hear it at first and it goes and that sound goes down that down sound, that's what Doppler is. That's when the sound is further away and it gets lower in tone. And that's basically what this uses. So there's some physics 30 for you. So the third and probably least techie way that we can measure the velocity is just using a ruler and another equation. So this is really an equation. It has the gravity uh, standard in it and it's got um, pi and all sorts of stuff. So what we can actually do is we can go into the stream and I will show this to you. And I'm gonna put the ruler in the water and I'll be able to measure the depth in one direction. And then I'm gonna turn the ruler against the flow and the water is gonna pile up on the back side of the ruler. And I'll be able to measure how high the water piles. So it'll probably be a centimeter or two. And then I can put that number into an equation and I can turn that into a velocity. This method is really good if the water is shallow and these other devices don't work as well in shallow water. So that's why we have some different options. So I'm gonna to try to find a safe spot where Kelsey can come down to the water carefully next to me and we can have a look.
Um, let's go back over here. Hello, closer. You good? You're safe. All right. So first, we'll put the ruler in one direction. The ruler is perpendicular to the flow. The water is flowing this way. And you can see there's a little tiny bit of piling up. And I can read that number. So it's about 21 centimeters, 21 and a half centimeters. And then I'm going to turn this. And now you guys can see how much more water is piling up. And so now the piling up amount is around, it's bumping around a little bit, but we're going to kind of average it around here. So I can look at that and I can read my ruler now. And that's about 25 centimeters. So we had four centimeters of water pile up. And we can take that and we can turn that into a velocity by putting that into a formula. And my guess here in this little spot here, this is probably about a half a meter a second. And that's a great velocity for fish. Fish don't like it when it's too fast. And some of these bugs do really well when the velocity is fast and the other bugs don't do as well. Um, so those are some of the things we do. And one of the last things we measure is rocks. Um, so I'm gonna get you guys, can somebody do a couple rocks for me? Yep. Yeah, you got some gloves? So why do we do this? Yep. So I showed you guys the big stone fly and that big stone fly needs a big house. He needs big space inside of the rocks. He likes rocks that are like this, that are nice big cobbles like this. And he also wants the rocks to be stable because if we get a big flood event, and we get um, all these rocks start to tumble in the river, um, that instability will just crush them. And that's also how we can tell if a flood has been through an area when we come back and we can measure the bugs because it changes what bugs are there. And what we're really focused on, you gave me a couple, is um, the intermediate axis of this rock. So if you think about this rock, it's kind of a unusual sort of shape, but if you actually look at it a little bit, you'll realize this is the skinniest, Part of the rock in here so that's the smallest axis and then you'll see this rock is biggest in this direction that's the longest axis and it's actually in this direction that we have the intermediate axis for the rock just do a couple for me and this measuring these gives a sense about how stable this river is so brad's going to show you what we do when we characterize a site, we come out and we measure a hundred rocks. So Brad will randomly take a couple of rocks and you'll see he's identified this rock on the intermediate axis and he's measured it. And then he'll toss that one away and he'll go back and he'll get another random rock. And we will record that. And that gives us a sense of what this river is likely to do under flooding and how much space we've got for all these different kinds of bugs. That's perfect, awesome. So those are the main components of the cabin program, this program that we use to do the biomonitoring of the bugs. And then this helps us understand the water quality of the river. We have assessed near the site a little bit upstream. And I can tell you this area usually gets an A on the report card. And for the most part, the water in the national parks is excellent. And the only places that we tend to have problems are places where we've got a lot of um, human use that's happening really close to the water and we can definitely see those impacts um, or places where we end up getting sediment maybe from road maintenance or things like that. Um, so for the most part, things are in really good shape here. And when we see some problems, we can come back and we can do some extra investigation. Excellent. So that's the main part about what I wanted to talk about. And I think it's over to you guys now. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you so, so much for such a neat and unique presentation. We've never done anything quite like that. The feedback's been tremendous, so that was awesome. 
I mean, we're going to dive in with questions. Uh, you guys, all our teachers have been really active. Everyone on YouTube has been really active. So we're going to dive in, see how many we can take. If you're on YouTube, if you haven't let me know where you're joining from, please do. We'd love to get some questions from teachers. But what we're going to do is start in Aurelia with Mr. Rutledge's class. And Mr. Rutledge, if you want to share Hi there. a question Thanks, with us? Uh, thanks again up? for the opportunity today. Uh, Noah from my class would like to know if the, if the river and the fish freeze in winter and also have the recent fires affected the water quality in Banff? Those are two really excellent questions. So let's take the first question first. Is this river going to freeze all the way to the bottom and do the fish freeze? Sometimes. Um, Sometimes the fish make mistakes about where they choose to hang out in the winter and they could definitely get caught in the ice, especially when we have a situation like this when winter comes really early and it gets really cold really fast and we don't have too much snow and the ice hasn't formed yet. We get this special kind of ice that grows up from the bottom and it's called frazzle and that's where the fish want to be too. And that kind of ice is, is bad for fish and it's a little bit bad for the bugs. Um, however, normally what happens is we get a nice covering of ice across the river and then we get snow on top and that acts like a blanket and that will cause all that frazzle ice underneath to eventually melt and then the fish will all be fine. But fish are really smart and one thing that fish can do and these bugs can do that we can't do is they understand, they can sense where groundwater is coming. So groundwater is water that's kind of underneath the rocks on the surface of the earth. It's flowing underneath the river and sometimes it gets forced up. And it happens to just be a little bit warmer than the air and everything that's going on. And it has a little bit of movement to it. And those places where there's groundwater and deep pools are safe from freezing. And that's usually where the fish go to hang out. So that was the first question. And then the second question was about water quality and fire and have we seen some changes in Banff? Um, so we haven't had a big fire recently in Banff. There's one out in the Front Ranges. It happened this fall. Um, but Waterson recently had um, a big fire a couple of years ago. And I have been here during some quite big fires over the years. And yes, you can see uh, changes to the chemistry and the bugs and sometimes the fish related to fire. And it depends a little bit. But one of the big changes that happens is... Um, there's um, often ash that's left over as part of the fire and it can be quite acidic. And so when the first rains kind of come after the fire, it will wash this acidic ash into the water. It can change the color of it and it can change the pH. And one thing that we worry about is that if it changes the pH too much, some of our fish don't like it being acidic. They really prefer it to be neutral or basic. And so that can be a problem for them. And then the other issue is that the ash can fill in all those little spaces around the rocks where we want the bugs to live. Having said that, fire is really important. It's very regenerative to the forest and the whole ecosystem. And as long as the whole park doesn't burn down at one time and all of our rivers don't have these, these little short-term changes, um, it's all part of the natural process that we want to see here. And we always have parts of the park that aren't affected um, by what's going on with fires. Fantastic answer. I want to know for our classes too, if you're interested in fire conservation, we've done a couple programs with Banff National Park about that. So you can check those out in our YouTube channel and I'll link that at the end. What I want to do now is go to Ms. Rump's class in Listowel, Ontario. If you guys want to ask a question, come on up. What is the biggest threat in this ecosystem? Wow. So I think I heard what is the biggest threat in this ecosystem? Yep. Well, there's two and they're kind of related. Um, our short-term, everyday biggest threat is people um, because we come with impacts. We build trails next to streams and we come here and we need to have some roads that are safe to drive on. And so maybe we put some culverts and we've got to put some salt and gravel down on the roads so our cars don't crash in winter. Some of those things are bad for the environment. And then people come here and I said, I was going to say this, they have to poop. And uh, when they're here pooping, hopefully it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, but the water is super pristine. And even though we treat it really well, um, we can still see a little bit of phosphorus and a little bit of nitrogen coming out of our wastewater treatment plants. And then if we get horses and people with their dogs who don't poop in the wastewater treatment plants in the bathroom, then we can have issues with that. So that's kind of our short term. And there's lots of stuff we can do about that. We can build our facilities really well we can make sure our wastewater treatment plants are upgraded. 
We can make sure we've got good riparian buffers next to the stream to intercept salt and sediment. So those are the, the main things. And I think our big thing that is this long-term thing that we don't really understand is climate change. Um, nobody really knows how it's gonna affect us. We think in the mountain parks, at least for water, we're gonna get more precipitation. We don't know if it's gonna be snow or rain, but we think we're gonna get more overall. So there's gonna be more water at certain times of the year, but we also know that it's getting warmer and our glaciers are melting. And so the water in the rivers here really comes in two parts. We get some water from the melting glaciers and we get other water from the snow and the rain. And nobody exactly understands what that change in ratio is gonna be, but things are definitely getting warmer and um, a little bit wetter in some locations. Great answer. Uh, all right, we have a class that wants to get really sciencey with you, Miss Burgess's class. They want to know the equation for measuring the velocity with the ruler. So if you have that offhand, great. And if not, we'll share it with the class later and you can email it to me. <laughs> I don't have it offhand. Um, I will send it to you. Let's see if I can remember it. First you take the distance and you multiply it by 9.8 meters and then you take the square root of it and then after you've taken the square root of it, I think you multiply it by two. And is that, that gives you what the velocity <laughs> is. Um, but we will give it to you guys so you can post it. And you know what I love about this, and part of the reason Environment Canada developed it, is there are a lot of stream keeper groups and volunteer groups that are out there trying to measure water quality. They cannot afford one of those $10,000 acoustic Doppler devices um, to take out just to check on how things are going. And so they were looking for a really nice, low tech, accurate way that anybody could do. And the ruler's perfect. They spent a lot of time perfecting it and studying it. And even a couple weeks ago, we did it um, using both methods and they were really um, similar. So it looks pretty good. So here is the formula. Oh, I didn't have it quite right. I put the square root in the wrong spot. So change in depth, remember we went from 21 centimeters to 25, then we divide it by 100, multiply it by 9.81, and then take the square root of the whole thing. And that gives you velocity in meters per second. And Got it? We, yeah, of course. We're all just doing the equation in our own classrooms right now. Um, that's great, thank you so much. All right, uh, a quick easy question from Ms. Croker's class. How are you able to go into the water when it's so cold out? What's going on? <laughs> So if she pans around, you will see that the biologists are wearing neoprene waders. These are like half mil, and the guys that aren't the biologists don't have neoprene waders, they're wearing pants. Um, so I, I can't even tell I'm in the water. I've got special boots on, and these neoprene waders go all the way down like socks around my feet. And then there's things on the bottom, so I don't slip on the ice. And um, it's kind of cozy in here. And then as you guys saw, none of my staff who are doing anything around the water touched any water with our bare hands. I've got little gloves on under here and then something over top just to make it waterproof. And we've got big fancy gloves. You could not go in this water. If you did not have proper clothes on, you would immediately get hypothermia and you would need to go to your vehicle straight away. Um, thank you to the scientist who posed with his leg as well. You can be stylish as a field worker. It's very exciting. Um, fantastic, guys. Great answer. All right, Mr. Boccia, Toronto class, come on in. we got time for a few more questions, and then we'll make sure that the class that can't get their questions live, there's a way that they can type them in after the fact. So, Mr. Boccia, come on in. Go for it. Hi. My class was interested in knowing how long mayflies live. Oh, how long do mayflies live? Um, so we think that the whole life cycle of the mayfly takes about a year. And that's why we do the sampling in the fall because the larval stages of the mayfly are their most mature. They will stay in that mature larval state underwater all winter. And then sometime on a nice day, next spring or summer, they will hatch. And when the mayflies hatch, they <clears throat> come up to the surface. They're actually a bug that flies around in the air. Uh, they get up to the surface, they pump out their wings, and then they break the surface tension of the water and they take off and they're beautiful. And they've got these little tiny gossamer wings and they can be different colors, usually green, sometimes blue. And they've got these three long tails. They will usually, once they're airborne, only live for one or two days. 
they find their mates, they fly around above the water and they mate and then they come down. And sometimes if you're at a lake, you will see them. They kind of bop along the top of the water. And what they're actually doing is laying their eggs. And then those eggs will sink down to the bottom and they will start to mature and they will hatch and turn into those little tiny larval mayflies that we saw. So if anybody has a fly fisherman in their family and you hear them talking about the hatch, or if you're out at a lake at night and you hear the fish jumping, they are coming to the surface to eat those mayflies, this, the flying ones, the adults, that are coming down to the water to lay their eggs. And when they come down to the surface of the water, the fish love that and they will come and they will catch them and eat them. Super, super cool. I, I want to stress for classes that might be keen on mayflies in general, the BBC did a series. I can't remember which one it was, but it was Mayflies in Hungary, and it was one of the most beautiful scenes in any natural history documentary ever. So I encourage you guys to check that out, and I'll find it for our classes that registered. I also want to note, we talked about caddisflies earlier. When you're done this broadcast, go home and check out caddisfly larvae and the little, like... Basically, houses they build themselves. It's one of the coolest things in nature. Super, super neat. I'd love to see you guys uh, learn about that online. All right, we got time for one more. Miss Pelche's class, come on in. Uh, if you have a question for us, go for it. Hey, Miss Pelche's group. Ah, sorry. Okay, we would like to know how many species of bugs there are in the water. Fantastic. Oh my God, that is a very hard question. And that's why I have to hire a taxonomist and I can't actually answer it. And interestingly, they can't either. Nobody can actually tell apart all the different species that are in the water. And we're starting to use DNA now to tell them apart because they look so similar. So generally what we do is we can't always get to species, but we can get to family. And so for these benthic macro invertebrates, these water bugs, we call it lowest taxonomic level. And there's probably a few hundred different readily identifiable species uh, or families of bugs that we could find in here. And not all the same locations have the same ones. So we've got a certain type of sto stonefly. Its name is uh, Terranarcella. There's like four different species of it in the world or in North America. They're super hard to tell apart unless you can take them apart and examine them with their DNA. And we only get them in places where there's wood. Um, so they like to be in places where there's logs. Um, so there's a ton of species and that's how come we have to hire these taxonomists to help us identify them. It is an amazing specialty and these people are super attention and detail oriented scientists that use microscopes and keys um, to try to figure out what all the species are. Yeah. Outstanding. So we're at the point where unfortunately time flies and we're having fun and we're near the end of the broadcast. So I want to make sure that the classes that are really interested in Banff can learn more. Where would you send classes that are interested in learning more about what you do, about macroinvertebrate sampling, about Banff National Park in general? Where can we send them to keep the learning going? So probably the best place to go is our website. Um, the Banff National Park website is the perfect place to go if people aren't able to come and visit the park or they're starting to plan for their next visit to the park. And we put information about our different programs on there. And if you end up coming to the park to visit, which we hope you can, um, we have these amazing interpreters and that is totally their job of what, what they do. And we have all sorts of guided hikes and interpretive opportunities at theaters and we go and we row. And so that is another really great um, way to get information when you come to visit the park or learn more about what's happening here. Outstanding. So I've left that up on the screen in the bottom. You guys can check out Banff National Park site. Check out our YouTube link, uh, including our full playlist of Banff sessions in the past, including this one, which has already been added. Uh, we'll share that with all the classes that register too. And I just want to say thank you so, so much for such a nice session. Uh, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our live classes so they can join me. So Ms. Pelfe, Ms. Rumpf, Ms. Burgess, and Mr. Rutledge, if you want to join me in saying a big thank you for joining us today, go for it, guys. Thanks so much, everyone.